Thank you, Simon, and uh, again, thank you very much, Dietmar, for for giving an insight into your paper, but also for for the the, the applause to to our to our study. Um, we were happy to do uh, together with um, colleagues at the Open Forum um, uh, uh, Europe and 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 some other co-authors. I was asked to uh, talk a little bit. Uh, more detail about how we we really calculated the economic impact um, and uh, I, I go a little bit into into depth here um, first of all that that was the the overall approach um, uh, we 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 looked at the literature also on on uh, open innovation uh, as, as maybe the the, the even bigger term um, and we also collected data and then we, we did different things. And I will talk about just the, the economic impact assessment. Uh, there were also case studies by, by Mirko Boom and Andrew Katz. Um, uh, and and uh, we conducted also a stakeholder survey to validate um, uh, the, the assessment we derived from more the econometric uh, exercises. And also here, Steven and Paula did uh, the, the analysis of the policy, policy initiative and that all went into the, the, the recommendations uh, I'm not going to talk about, but um, very nicely to see that also um, Frank Nagel, to, to which I also really send my, 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 my big thank for, for inspiring us uh, both regarding uh, how to deal with data. I will come back to that and also the methodological approach because he just published a paper where he compared um, our recommendations with what the U.S. should should do in a Brookings Institute paper, therefore, uh, for those who are interested in that. But I'm not talking about that. Okay, that, that's the overall approach um, where we, we um, kind of had different types of validations. Uh, we looked at the, the benefit uh, assessment, um, and here I, I will just focus on the macroeconomic analysis. Uh, we also looked uh, or asked uh, here stakeholders and to uh, to kind of try to assess the different benefit dimensions of open source and then uh, sure one has also to uh, compare it with with, uh, with the cost side here we looked uh, at the macro level uh, on, on the investments um, in the eu uh, into open source um, and we also looked at individual uh, contributors the top contributors um, in, in, in Europe, and, and then we, we validated these kind of uh, macro and micro approaches and the cost and the benefits. And my focus uh, today will be on the left hand side, where we just compare um, the, the cost on the macro level and the benefits on the macro level uh, a little bit more, more in, in detail. Um, the data sources uh, here we, we follow. Um, a previous paper by Frank Nagel, who, uh, who looked at uh, the impact of um, uh, public procurement law changes in France uh, on, on their uh, innovation performance. And uh, he used the data from, from GitHub, and, and therefore we, we followed this. It means we looked both at uh, the, the comments, we also looked at the, the users and their organizational uh, affiliations. Um, and tried uh, as far as the data allowed that to, to attribute that to the different uh, EU member states. Um, uh, we know that's not complete. That, that means overall we are probably underestimating um, the contributions by, by factor two or, or even by, by three, but at, uh, at least by, by two. Um, and then we combined it with other um, economic data from the OECD US that also looking at um, uh, the, um, the European Patent Office uh, um, data just to uh, get an indication of knowledge. And we also looked at, at the, um, uh, at the um, Crunchbase uh, database of startups because uh, some other paper, paper by Boy Wright and others also co-authored by Frank Nagel uh, they they also looked at that, and we we, um, we we also kind of leveraged these insights to the EU, and that therefore this number Dietmar already showed of having 600 additional ICT startups per year in the EU based on 
on open source contributions uh, is another insight which I am not uh, really going into detail um, today. Okay, um, this is the development of the comets uh, between 2008 and 18. That was the last year we could look at, and overall we see this is this is this is going up uh, in, in all our member states. There are some uh, special kind of uh, issues here for Greece, uh, some some artificial changes. But even if we take this out, uh, the, the robust are quite um, uh, the, the results are quite robust. Um, uh, new new figures I have seen um, in 2019. There was a data problem because we took the, the data from uh, GT Torrance from uh, Delft University. They had some data problem in 2019, but looking at 2020, uh, we have still an upward uh, uh, trend uh, in contrast to some other two recent papers uh, which have been published, one and plus one, uh, but based on a quite uh, yeah questionable methodology. These are the, the comments um, by the EU member states, and um, uh, here are also the, the, the contributors, um, uh, uh, also per, per country, and we also see it, it's going up. There was some slowdown in uh, 2018, uh, but, but overall this is uh, uh, again uh, taking up in, in 2020 again, therefore um, still, still increasing uh, contributions, although um, for example, recently Bitcom, the, the German uh, industry association, they, they launched the open source monitor in 2019. I was also kind of co-founder, co-sponsor on that. And uh, one big problem is certainly that uh, the skilled uh, shortage in, 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 in uh, it is a via and this is going to, to become more relevant. Therefore, uh, maybe later in the policy discussion, uh, we, we can take this topic up. That means that's the, 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 the data. Um, and what we did, uh, we uh, looked then, okay, if we really then uh, try to calculate what are the costs of these contributions, um, we looked both at the, the member states level, and then also we looked at the efforts by the most active companies uh, located in the EU. Yeah? Um, and as I already mentioned, this is really lower bound. Um, an assessment um, because uh, not all of the, the contributors really uh, disclose uh, where they are located. Uh. Um, overall, the basic assumption that is that these uh, contributions are going into the public domain. This is uh, this innovation comments, what, what uh, Dietmar presented before, um, and uh, that these investments will outweigh the, the cost, but Due to knowledge below us, uh, the benefits are much higher. No? Um, but uh, if we if we really take these numbers um, uh, and we put them a little bit in, in context, we have around three million employees in the computer program programming sectors in the EU, and we found uh, in 2018 about yeah almost 10 percent are contributors to to GitHub, and probably uh, we are it's probably more 15 to 20 percent. And if we um, kind of use then um, uh, some some methodology um, uh, to uh, to calculate the the, the labor cost, uh, we we get up. If they would really full time work on that, we uh, we would see labor costs on investment of 14 billion. If we take the comets instead and um, and and use the so-called constructive cost model. We get to 16,000 full-time equivalents, and uh, this would be then an investment of 1 billion um, labor cost or personal cost in the EU in 2018. That's, that's the cost side. Um, then looking a little bit more in the, into the structure, who contributes, we find that um, here uh, these, these companies, which are most active, uh, um, these are counting for 12% of the contributors and, and one third of the comet. And overall, they employ more than 1 million employees, these companies. Uh, but if you're looking in, in detail, these are in general very small companies, even micro companies. That means 75% uh, of these top contributors have less than 100 employees. Uh, and we also see that the smaller the companies, the more contributors are listed. Uh, and the more comments they provide. Uh, um, 
It means uh, uh, the, the contributions are done by 50% of companies which have less than 50 employees. Um, and on the other hand, uh, especially the, the small companies here, 5% of their full-time equivalents are involved in, um, in contributing to open source. That means that's a, that's a little bit of a, a different structure than we find for the US, especially really the large players uh, the, the big techs uh, are making really more uh, major contributions to open source. You know? um, however, if we really put uh, these figures together with the macro figures, uh, we get a, a quite uh, a validated um, picture on, on the cost side. Okay, the cost side is always easier than, than the, 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 the benefit side and here we rely on a traditional uh, macroeconomic model, uh, the so-called Douglas production function. Uh, Frank Nagel also used that for um, his work on, on US companies on the company level, but we can also do it on the, on the aggregate level. And the, 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 the idea is, okay, if you're looking at the, the GDP at the output of, of a country, it's, it's more or less um, the, the product of capital and labor. Uh, plus uh, some uh, knowledge stock uh, and uh, the knowledge stock we, we use R&D, uh, research and development, uh, plus some previous stock and here we, we take the, the, the patent data and, and overall uh, these uh, changes, that means this, the logarithm of these uh, values and here a special thanks to my uh, colleague Torben Schuber, who, who did the, the econometrics, is based on R and D on on previous uh, on the patent stock as as a knowledge stock, but then on capital labor and uh, the contributions to to open source. Uh, uh, also the contribution of their own country, but also the contribution by the rest of the world. That was the overall approach, and what we did then is uh, we 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 kind of modeled uh, something just for the EU, taking the EU together and uh, looking at the, the total uh, knowledge pool of um, the, the, the EU yeah, as, as the base um, and uh, calculated then the so-called elasticity. The, the elasticity is the, 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 the measurement of the percentage change of, of one variable in response to another one. That means uh, how the GDP in the EU member states changes uh, according to the contribution to open source. And what we find are, are two different uh, types of uh, elasticities. One, uh, here we use the, the comets as, as an input uh, and the measurement for open source. And the other one is, is uh, using the contributors. And the elasticity is 0.04 and 0.06. What does it mean? This means that, um, and we, we have seen these 10% increases in, in, the, in the comets uh, in the last year, especially from 2070 to 80. That means then if we have an elasticity of 0.04, uh, this means that um, the, the contributions to, to GitHub or to open source um, are contributing 0.4% of GDP in the EU. Um, and uh, if we take these numbers, then we get to around 60 billion uh, contribution of open source in uh, 2018. Um, if we uh, take the, the number of contributors as an indicator, uh, then uh, this 10% increase in the number of contributors would push the GDP in the EU by 0.6%, and then we would have even a total contribution in 2018 up to 95 billion. Yeah? That means overall uh, this is really a, a significant uh, uh, contribution uh, uh, from the global pool of open source uh, into the EU uh, uh, GDP and, um, and for the future we could even uh, assume that uh, maybe we reach 100 uh, billion per year. Um, we used this approach already 20 years ago to address or, and calculate the impact of uh, standardization to the uh, German economy and, and by then, 20 years ago, we found um, a contribution of 15 uh, billion to the, EU, um, uh, to the German economy and therefore the numbers are, um, are not really uh, too different. Um, 
in the last step, we, um, we, we put the different numbers together and at first think you say, okay, these are very high cost benefit ratio, but you have to, to assume that um, uh, you, um, uh, you rely on, on the, the open source uh, contribution also in previous years. There are some uh, figures about the lifetime or the half time of, of open source code projects and uh, we assumed a kind of a linear relationship of 10% uh, uh, depreciation and uh, therefore we have to multiply the, uh, the contribution in 2018 by 5 and then we get to a cost benefit uh, ratio of 12 to 1 and uh, in, a, in a, a last step we also consider uh, the hardware cost, uh, and then overall we we are con quite con conservative uh, in our calculations. We get a ratio of one to four, um, and this ratio of one to four is is quite close to uh, um, a ratio uh, which has been recently uh, published by Jones and Summers, uh, where they they calculated the impact of um, R and D spending on on GDP. Uh, by by really kind of doing a meta study, comparing different different approaches, and they get also to uh, cost benefit ratio of if you spend one one euro or one dollar into open, uh, into R and D, uh, the the economy kind of benefits by five uh, dollars or, or or euros, and that's uh, and depending on some scenarios, it goes even up uh, to one to ten. But overall, this is this is our approach. And um, and this is quite consistent with what has been done before. Um, then we also derived some parallel policy recommendations. I'm not going into it. Maybe we can talk about them later. Um, these are the the, the overall uh, uh, kind of um, um, suggestions. Uh, looking at institutional capital uh, capacity in the, in the public sector, but especially it's about knowledge creation and diffusion because here the economic impact is, is strongest. It's also about entrepreneurial aspects, regulatory issues, and so on. Yeah? But overall, and to, to come to the end uh, now, uh, we see there's a really a large economic impact of open source uh, um, for the EU. And um, we see also a potential impact of the open, emerging open source hardware. But um, one has really to, uh, to push this. Um, and this is also in line with the Dietmar Haro's uh, kind of innovation policy recommendation from their paper uh, that uh, we have to, to incentivize uh, the, the contributions in order really to reap and exploit the benefits for, for the European economy. And we have also to, to be aware that uh, uh, different policy areas have to be coordinated uh, in a quite kind of complex way in, in order really to be able to uh, exploit these these benefits. Thank you. And thanks again also to the uh, co-authors co and the, the contributors also to the stakeholders uh, surveys and the, and the case studies. Great, thank you Knut very much. Then I think uh, Johannes, we can, um, uh, we can continue with your presentation. I'm gonna make you a presenter also in a second. Um, Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. OK, then let me also share my screen and get started right away. Just one moment. So can you see my screen? Yes, I assume so. Yes, it's coming up. Yes, we can see your screen. Let's just hope Great. that the full screen also works. Yes, it works. Fantastic. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sivan. Thank you to the organizers uh, for this wonderful opportunity to speak at this uh, this event. Thank you also to uh, Knut and Dietmar for a very interesting talk so far. Um, I want to present some uh, uh, recent work today that's uh, currently under revision. Hopefully, uh, there will be a, a, a publication out of this soon. No working papers available, but. Uh, I'm interested in the geography of open source software in particular, and I think there are some nice complements between what um, what we found in our study and and the this this wonderful report that 
um, forms the basis of this event. Um, just to introduce myself, I'm Johannes Wax. I'm uh, an assistant professor at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. I'm also a faculty member at the Complexity Science Hub, uh, also in Vienna. And uh, let's get to it. So uh, as Kino just mentioned, um, there is this emerging body of literature, which has been greatly strengthened by this report uh, that tries to measure, uh, and I think does, quite, does so quite successfully, the effect of open source software on the economy. Just to quote from the report, I, I think both of the previous speakers have had this on the slide before, but I think it, it certainly uh, merits repeating that an increase of 10% in contributions would generate between 0.4% to 0.6% additional EU, EU GDP per year and more than 600 additional ICT startups per year in the EU. So um, there are some mechanisms discussed in the report. Of course, this is not all of them, but um, I think they it, it helps to drill down into the mechanism and this motivates why I'm interested in geography so much. So some of the mechanisms for these costs, uh, for, for this uh, these gains in productivity include the idea that open source software is a public good, so we can reuse code and build on the work of others. This is, uh, uh, links to the idea of the open source software as a kind of commons um, that we can all benefit from. Uh, using open source software saves uh, saves money, so especially in the public administration, uh, this is a, a great way to save some some costs to cut costs. And uh, open source software is open and transparent, and this leads to this idea that uh, that it may have a higher standards and quality than uh, than proprietary or closed source software. This is um, kind of referencing the uh, the old idea that uh, with many eyes, all bugs are shallow. Um, <clears throat> but this leads uh, left me asking a question: uh, Does it matter where open source software is created? So none of these mechanisms for for why uh, open source software may benefit the economy say anything about where this is being made beyond at maybe a country level. And I think that geography actually matters a lot more than we might think or hope. So uh, to quote some geographers, uh, despite the digital age and the digital economy we all live in, the notion of distance is certainly not dead. So um, there are some papers that show that the likelihood of collaboration on GitHub decays exponentially with distance. This is um, both of these papers fit a kind of gravity equation to the likelihood of uh, collaboration as a function of distance. And in 2010 and both 2020, the same result came out that um, we are more, much more likely to collaborate with people on GitHub uh, if they live close to us. Of course, many, many reasons why we might expect that, but it is certainly a sort of empirical fact. On the other side, we also may think that um, many of the benefits of open source software, so the economic benefits, might accrue or build up locally for, for several reasons, for several mechanisms. And here I also uh, uh, build a lot on the work of uh, Frank Nagel. Um, <clears throat> first, we know that firms learn and gain feedback by contributing to open source software. Um, firms using open source software also tend to become more productive. And finally, uh, this is a kind of information story, firms, workers, and investors use the information revealed by open source software contributions to make better choices. So let me uh, say a little bit more about that last point. So um, uh, firms use open source software contributions to decide who to hire. Hiring software developers is, uh, is a very difficult, difficult problem for in the software industry. It's very hard to, um, to predict uh, a person's uh, ability at software and the, how good of a, a an employee they will be uh, developing software and uh, open source software contributions give a, a, a strong and credible signal of, of uh, ability that um, smoothens out this, this rather difficult labor market. Um, developers or, or workers as I call them in this, in this slide uh, also benefit from this. They may see a firm that has uh, made open source software contributions and they may, uh, they may benefit from this information. They may uh, they may better be able to choose the firms they, they like to work with. And for example, they also might enjoy the fact that they'll have, uh, if they join a firm that contributes to open source software, they can, contrib they can also continue 
to contribute to open source software and keep this kind of visibility um, that is not uh, unfortunately not so not so easy to do when you're working at a company that uses only closed source. Finally, investors use information uh, revealed by open source software contributions uh, to make investment decisions. So if you're a venture capitalist, if you're an investor, it can be quite hard to evaluate the quality of a firm, the, qu the quality of technology. But if you can look into at least part of their code base or see what kind of contributions they're making uh, to open source, you might have an additional information edge and be uh, able to make a better decision. So these are ways in which uh, benefits of open source software and their impact on the economy actually happen very locally. So of course, an investor can invest money across a great distance, but the benefits accrue to specific firms, people working uh, in specific areas. Of course, we're in the, the age of uh, the explosion of remote work, but still most people do work uh, in the same city as, the, the, uh, as their employing firm. Um, I also want to reference uh, a very recent, this is a very fresh paper from uh, just, a, just a, this, this is a preprint posted just over a week ago um, by uh, Chattergun and Kerr that shows how important uh, technology and software is in the broader world of innovation. So in the diagram, on the, in the ch chart on the left, on the x-axis, you have years binned into five-year uh, five bins. On the y-axis, you have uh, the share of all patents made, uh, so this is the United States is the universe, and we have four lines, each representing a different group of cities. What we see on the left is that six tech cluster cities, so these are San Francisco, Boston, Seattle, San Diego, Denver, and Austin, uh, contributed something like 10% of patents in the late 70s. By now, one in three patents made in the US is filed in one of these cities, one of these six cities, at the same time, uh, the largest cities, so New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and two others, um, have rather declined. And the, uh, the chart on the right breaks this down into software and non-software patents. In the US, you can patent software. Um, and we see that most of this difference, most of this change is due to, to uh, work in the software activity, uh, uh, activity in the software field, pardon me. So really this, it, it, this, this signals that, um, that geography does matter, so that software and open source software development may be taking place in very specific areas. So we investigated these, uh, these questions, and um, well, here they are. Let me go through them. First, does open source software activity actually cluster significantly in space? Does it cluster more than other kinds of high-tech uh, or innovation-intensive activities? If so, where are these hotspots? Third, can we explain the ingredients needed for places to promote and attract open source software development and developers? And then can we translate these into policy ideas? So with that view, we, we set out to do the following. Well, we wanted to measure geography, the geography of open source software developers in 2021. So we, we uh, did the geocoding in uh, uh, the late winter around March. And um, this is how we did it. So we, this is joint work, by the way, with um, my co-authors, Marius, William, and Axel. We built a pipeline to generate geographic data on open source software developers. We looked up what we call active software developers on GitHub using the GH archive database. This is a bit different than the GH torrent database. Um, for the technical details, see the, see the preprint. And we uh, set the inclusion criteria for uh, uh, developers at 100 commits across 2019, 2020. Um, so while we don't have 32 million, while there are 32 million GitHub accounts, um, according to this activity threshold of 100 commits over two years, um, we are left with about 1.1 million developers. And then we geolocated them using uh, the Bing Maps API and some heuristics uh, applied to user-provided uh, locations on GitHub, Twitter, and commit email suffixes. So here's an example, developer X. On her Git, GitHub profile, she mentions that she lives in Austria. On her linked Twitter profile, she mentions that she lives in Wien, which is the German word for Vienna. And uh, she frequently makes commits from an email address uh, at wu.ac.at. That's the uh, uh, email suffix of my university. And from this, we use some heuristics to infer that she, developer X, actually lives in Vienna. And this pipeline lets us joke 
geolocate over half a million active open source software developers around the world. Before I get into the regional analysis, let me let me say one or two words about um, what we found at the country level. First, we found that country shares of all active uh, open source software contributors on GitHub in 2021 uh, compare in an interesting way to previous snapshots. So we took two snapshots from the, from the literature, one created in 2008 um, using data from SourceForge, and one created in 2010 also using data, data from GitHub. And what we observe is that between countries, since 2010, we have a much more even distribution around the world of the share of open source software developers. So while the United States alone accounted for more than one third of all open source software developers, uh, just 10 years ago, now it's down to about a fourth. And who are the, which are the countries that are, that are gaining? Um, these are uh, the biggest gainers are China, India, Brazil, Russia, Japan, South Korea. So um, Southeast Asia, Latin America is also doing, doing much, much better relatively. So in some sense, we can say that open source software development is spreading out through the world, which is, a, I think, a great thing. Um, and I also want to note that this is not just a story about rich countries versus poor countries. So here on the x-axis, I plot, um, so these are, these are all countries. On the x-axis, I plot the country's GNI per capita. It's a logarithmic scale. On the y-axis, I plot the number of GitHub contributors uh, per million inhabitants, also on a logarithmic scale. And though we see a, a clear and significant correlation, we, all, we can only explain around 40% of variance using, uh, economics, uh, using economic development. Um, and we also see some interesting outliers. So who do we have here above the, the regression line? We have Ukraine, Brazil, uh, Serbia, Belarus, Bulgaria. Also, let me point out Estonia. So these are countries that are doing much better than expected given their level of economic development. And then we have some uh, unfortunate laggards, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, so these are the Gulf oil states. Um, for given how rich they are, there are relatively few GitHub contributors living in those countries. So um, what we can do is we can explain up to 75% of the variance between countries using just uh, uh, two, two interesting uh, features, economic development, so GNI per capita, and the UN's human development in indicator as features in a regression model. So what does this mean? It means, well, at the country level, uh, it's relatively easy to predict uh, how much open source software activity happens in a country using just a few features. So if you give me a, an imaginary country with a, an economic development level and a human development indicator, I can predict, roughly speaking, how many open source software developers there will be. Of course, there will still be uh, deviations, there will still be residuals, but at the country level, it seems that this is a, a, this can, many of the things can be explained with structural features. So let's zoom in to the regional level. That's the point of my, uh, my talk. Um, so let's look at, this is a, uh, the report is about the EU, about Europe. Um, we also looked at European regions. We also included uh, uh, the UK, Norway, Switzerland, uh, and some other uh, non-EU non countries, but certainly European countries. And what we see when we plot this map is that we see immediately intense regional concentration at the NUTS2 level. The winning region, uh, it might not surprise you, is Berlin. Um, and these are per capita uh, numbers. Berlin has 175 active open source software contributors per 100,000 inhabitants. That's a, a quite impressive number. And the other, uh, the other uh, regions, uh, and these are next two regions, uh, with greater than 100 contributors per 100,000 inhabitants are London, Zurich, Oslo, Prague, Stockholm, and Amsterdam. Um, <clears throat> So one thing we can observe from this map uh, is that in some countries, it seems that, that there, there's an intense concentration within specific parts of countries. And by the way, these colors are binned in a sort of logarithmic way. These are called jens caspel bins. So the, there is a, indeed a very large difference between the brighter shades and the, the darkest ones. So let's compare metropolitan France with the Czech Republic. The differences between regions seem larger in the latter, that is in the Czech Republic. And the question is, can we, can we measure this? Of course, we can look at the map and we can squint and we can say, well, uh, open source activity is much more concentrated in the Czech Republic and France, but can we actually quantify this so we can make comparisons? 
So what we do, what we did is we adopted a measure of geographic concentration uh, from the OECD called adjusted geographic concentration or AGC for short. It ranges from zero to one. It takes the value of zero if open source software developers are spread exactly uh, according to the population. So this measure also takes into account that different regions have different uh, uh, populations, different densities. And it goes to one if all open source software contributors are concentrated in the least populated region in the country. So basically what we see is that France has a low AGC, relatively low AGC score of 0 0.28, indicating that the open source software developers are spread out a bit more in France versus in the Czech Republic, they're quite concentrated. Um, and we can do this for all the countries in our data set. By the way, we don't just have uh, data on regions from uh, European countries. We also have the United States, Japan, China, Russia, Brazil, India. Uh, and we can also calculate this AGC score for different kinds of individuals and their distribution through a country, through the regions. So for university educated individuals or individuals working in high tech fields. I take these data from Eurostat, by the way. What we see is that the concentration of open source software developers exceeds the concentration of uh, either university educated people or individuals working in high tech fields. Um, and we see this, the dark blue uh, points are with one exception, this is Greece, um, are significantly above the concentration measures for high tech workforce and, edu and university educated people. This goes to say that open source software activity seems to be extremely concentrated within regions. And this is not just a European story. So these are the uh, top 10 US metropolitan statistical areas in terms of contributors per capita. These are uh, MSAs with at least a million people. Um, and actually we can use our data to estimate that 34% of all US based open source software developers are living in the six tech hubs of Chattergoon and Kerr. That was that study I mentioned a few slides ago. Uh, and just to remind you that these six tech hubs account for a third of all US patents and 45% of software patents. So, th so this regional clustering is not just, a, not just a European story. Can we explain, uh, can we explain using structural factors this concentration? So recall that at the national level, we can explain 75% of variance in open source software activity between countries using human and economic development indicators using you know, a regression framework. We can only explain 50% of the variance between NOTS2 regions with a similar approach. Uh, the conclusion from this is that local open source software activity is much more idiosyncratic. Nevertheless, we found some interesting uh, features which are highly correlated with NOTS2 open source software activity, namely, tertiary education attainments, so university gra uh, graduates living in the place, uh, employment in high-tech industries. And interestingly, um, there's this nice measure of uh, general social trust measured by the European Value Survey. This is uh, available for many European NUTS2 regions. This uh, connects nicely with the story that uh, contrib contributions to um, open source software are a kind of uh, uh, public good provision and uh, certainly there's a rich literature on the link between social trust and contributing to public goods. I won't dive into that, uh, time is tight. So let's revisit our questions. First, does open source software activity actually cluster significantly in space? And the answer here is a resounding yes. What are the hotspots? Well, in Europe, you might not be surprised, but these are London, Berlin, Prague, et cetera. Um, can we explain the ingredients needed for a place to promote and attract open source software development and developers? It seems not very well. It's rather an idiosyncratic thing at the regional level. And then the open question is, can we translate these into policy ideas? Um, <clears throat> well, regional and, and, and city level policy is quite different from national policy. And that's why I think it's, it's worth really thinking about this a bit harder. So even though regions and cities generally don't have as much legislative regulatory power as, as uh, countries or national parliaments, they have the advantage that they can often be more flexible. So while they may not be able to, to, to uh, tune the tax levers quite as, quite as powerfully as the national governments, they can focus uh, a bit more on what's needed locally. And we can also draw on a rich literature on what's called cluster policy. This is the idea behind cluster policy is 
how can we encourage agglomerations of specific kinds of activities? So this is usually applied to, to innovation intensive uh, industries and sectors. Some ideas coming from this are that we should try to foster informal networks. And this has actually been a key to Silicon Valley's uh, flourishing. This is already, uh, uh, there's a great paper by Saxanian in, in 19, from 1990 that documents the informal networks in Silicon Valley in the 80s that kind of kept it going through uh, a bit of a rough patch and hard times. Um, a second idea is to give people opportunities to meet in person, encourage mentoring relationships. So mentoring is one of the, the, the has been shown to be one of the most effective ways to get people into open source. A third uh, idea at the, which would be effective at the regional or city level is to advise firms on the benefits of open source software. Perhaps they could cite these nice papers from uh, Frank Nagel. And another, uh, another arm here is to involve local universities. And this goes into the direction of uh, Helix models of innovation and development. So I can't say everything uh, I want to about policy. Indeed, this, this is the, uh, the end of my presentation. Uh, I just want to mention that uh, the data and code are available uh, on GitHub, and we have a preprint out uh, posted to the archive. I also want to thank Bruce and my co-authors, uh, who you can see here. And if you have any questions, uh, of course, we're happy, I'm happy to, to have a chat now, but uh, feel free to reach out to me directly after the conference or workshop. Thank you. Thank you, Johannes, and also thanks to Knut. Um, well, I'm inviting you both to come back. So, you, well, Johannes to stay in essence and Knut to come back. Um, let's see if we have a few questions. I think uh, some uh, positive feedback that I'm very happy about. Um, uh, if some people are still uh, gathering the, the confidence to ask questions. Um, one of the things I guess I was wondering a little bit about is um, how to uh, if you see if some of the um, let's say some of the um, more sp specific more local ways of analyzing contributions could also be used to make an analysis on, on, on the EU level um, to kind of um, add to the analysis of on the EU level um, kind of give it maybe a little bit more um, a, a local uh, aspect First of all, thanks, Johannes. Great work, uh, which is nice, kind of nice complementing what what we did on on the on the aggregate level. Um, uh, and and I, I was not even aware that that um, this could have been also an opportunity for us to to dig down. But but you you have done the work, and therefore therefore I think um, this is this is really then pushing. Uh, the um, also the the knowledge kind of body on on, on open source uh, further we have the macro level and now we have the regional level but we have the, the company uh, studies by Frank um, in the US uh, it goes down on the micro level um, and uh, therefore I think we have now already a, a good starting point and uh, what what I'd like to to do is is a little bit um, Looking at your your policy um, ideas and and indeed um, and we did that and we just finishing a study for the the German government on uh, how to kind of optimize their um, uh, kind of uh, entrepreneurship policies uh, startup uh, programs and uh, and so far uh, we 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 revisited kind of what's there and there's nothing uh, which is pointing to the role of open source and uh, and uh, thanks to what frank did but also now now related to your work i think there's there's empirical evidence that um uh, these these hubs you identified are also startup hotspots uh, berlin is in 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 germany they uh, i think they get more than half of the funding um Private and public uh, means, uh, and and I know also startups in the field, and and indeed they they rely on on, on open source, and and but this this is not yet in the at least at the national level that's not yet reflected, and we at least included one recommendation, a specific recommendation towards considering the open source aspect. I think that's that's an issue. Another thing. 
uh, and and this is other work. Um, we did some work about Berlin because Berlin is the only city in the world which has its own innovation panel. Um, and together with colleagues from uh, ZDV, we we looked at the innovation activities around the, the research institutes here in Berlin and what we see distance matters. Um, but if if we are looking at the the uh, and, and universities have the third mission, the transfer. Yeah. Uh, but here again, um, uh, we uh, we as as uh, Technical University of Berlin, we we published a, a transfer strategy where we kind of expanded the the channels uh, towards first the initiation, but also open source contribution to open source. But um, so far in the other. Um, documents I, I couldn't find that universities are really taking this uh, transfer channel really actively on their on their list I think that's that's an, an, an another point to uh, to really at least communicate with the universities okay if, do you think about it because I also know from colleagues here to Berlin that this plays plays an important role um, and and even for regional policies um, uh, cluster policies. I think uh, open source should uh, at least get into the the, the mainstream thinking. Uh, it's not only about maybe doing co-publications or co-patenting. Uh, we we pushed some uh, some ideas towards maybe doing collaborative uh, standardization activities, but also collaborative open source activities should be at least maybe eligible for funding in such cluster policies yeah? and uh, and since since open source is also entering new new areas like like biotech yeah? it's not not only the traditional IT sectors uh, but but it's really kind of entering more or less all other areas of, of the economy and therefore this is this is uh, uh, kind of uh, what you did together what we did to, together I think this is also uh, a lot of food for thought uh, then also for for game changing or at least uh, expanding um, considerations at the policy sides regarding uh, taking this this great opportunity on board because on the other hand what we what we see more and more and the, and the, the this Bitcoin survey really kind of uh, reveals that and confirms that that the skills shortage is is getting is getting uh, Especially in the IT area, a, a major challenge, especially for Europe. Yeah, I, I agree wholeheartedly. Um, maybe, maybe something I could say about the universities uh, that we observed in our data is that um, so besides the the traditional tech hubs, which again I, I think aren't were not so surprising, some surprising regions that did very well. Uh, are um, uh, regions without very large cities, but with uh, large and famous technical universities. So in Norway, or around Trondheim, uh, where the large Norwegian technical university is located in Germany, around Aachen, where uh, RWTH Aachen, which is a very large and successful German technical university is located, and in Karlsruhe, these were, these were kind of hot spots where you, uh, of course, reflecting on the fact that these are uh, locations hosting these technical universities, perhaps not totally surprising, but at first glance, it's surprising that Karlsruhe is 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 doing so well. So I think the universities play a really key role. I think that um, Vienna is a very good example of a place where a city uh, doesn't wait. Vienna, by the way, is its own region, is a has a quite independent government. Um, uh, Vienna is a place where they don't wait for the national uh, national government to to do the right policy to take steps towards innovation. They take it in their own hands, and they also work very uh, very closely with um, with universities. There's a actually a Vienna level funding agency that that distributes uh, quite a substantial amount of funding each year. So uh, yeah, wholeheartedly agree. It's uh, it's quite interesting because Simon Simon Phillips just makes a point, and there's a little discussion now happening in the in the chat. But uh, because Simon Simon says, I'd also expect Red Hat locations to have an undue magnetism uh, as the developers sort of convert to being company people. And of course, um, you showed the Czech Republic before, 
And you should, of course, there was Prague. And then there was the region that Bruno is located in, which I know has a big Red Hat yes. uh, office. Oh, well, yeah, Simon, Bruno, yeah, we, same thinking. Um, and they surely have also some impact and maybe also university there. Uh, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on um, the discussion regarding uh, OSS contributing, um, OSS, uh, you know, well, the discussion is happening essentially on um, mobility of uh, developers and job mobility here. Yeah, so this is the classic, the classic chicken or egg question. So are the developers uh, going to a place um, because there are other developers and they like it there? Or are um, people going to a place and then or living in a place and then they, they're more likely to become developers because many people are developing around them? And I mean open source software developers. I think, uh, I think it's a mix of both. I think there are feedback loops. I don't think it's just that, you know, uh, people are equally likely to get into open source everywhere, and then they make the decision to to join uh, the tech hubs like Berlin and and Prague. Um, I think it's a mix of both. I think we need to do a better job measuring it. And I, I take the point completely from uh, uh, Simon and and Jan that um, we need to we need to measure this to make the right policy decisions. I think uh, a good a good null hypothesis is fifty fifty. But uh, um, it seems the the chat thinks that it's um, maybe eighty twenty in favor of mobility. I'm happy to see a study that uh, that that looks into this. That's a uh, that's a future research area. So I'll make a note of it. <laughs> um, I'm also seeing uh, Marco has a question for Knut. I didn't read it now. Um, yeah, but I mean, Knut, yeah, we... I'm sure you can, can, can react to it. Uh, maybe I can I can uh, briefly respond to Mark. Yeah, indeed, um, um, it's, a, it's a simplified approach to look at the, at the contributions, and and it would be much more interesting to see what is the value added uh, the contributions generate. But uh, this is uh, this is on the macro level. This is this is not a feasible approach. You can do that maybe. Uh, uh, on the micro or, or in, on a case-based level to see a kind of uh, uh, what what is really the, the value added, but but uh, in these micro models, uh, this is this is not not not, not an approach, and uh, um, and also the, that's also an, an issue. The the diffusion or use of of open source uh, is is not so easy to measure, uh, especially at the micro level. There there are some. Uh, the, the studies Frank Nagel did, uh, where he used kind of pro propriety uh, databases, close uh, was an approach, um, but it's based on a quite a limited number of of, of companies um, uh, for for the US. Um, if if such data is is publicly available, it would have been good to use it, but um, so far it's it's not. Uh, uh, it was not feasible for us. Uh, I'm also seeing uh, Dirk's uh, comment on China, and we in the study we did also some analysis on China and did some interviews on some, with some experts um, who said that uh, due to the lang language and some to some degree culture barrier, there are, um, and also geopolitical reasons today, that's of course uh, an increasingly important point now. Um, there's a large kind of um, a group of Chinese developers who are not on GitHub and who are therefore not included in this analysis. I mean, there I definitely agree also with what Dirk said. Um, uh, and I think, you know, this kind of point on what, what is the database, um, you know, has been raised a few times and I think it's, it's, it's a very, very fair uh, point. Um, on the other hand, at least for our study, considering that we're analyzing in Europe is probably still a pretty comprehensive data set, uh, considering what is you know realistically being used in Europe. Just seeing if there are any further questions now. If you Stuart said something, I guess that's on the discussion that Simon kicked off. Yes. Uh, okay. Let's see. Carlo asked a question. Yeah, maybe one last issue. Uh, regarding the, the universities, uh, uh, indeed, and that was also um, one of our observations, um, teaching open source is, is not so common. Yeah? Um, 
um, in, in universities here. We, we are happy to have kind of Mirko Böhm <laughs> on board who, who gives courses uh, on, on this topic. Um, but uh, we, we also a little bit screened um, master programs in Europe and uh, we, we really didn't find a lot. And this is, this is uh, also, I think, um, uh, a big uh, yeah, suggestion and uh, to, uh, to really uh, get uh, also the, 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 the students, especially at the technical universities, which are obviously the, the, the hot spots um, um, for contributions, but also then at the end for, for startup uh, hubs. Uh, um, um, uh, that they that they get the, the know how not only to 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 write the code but uh, then also maybe to commercialize it in an, in a second step uh, with with the kind of viable business models uh, for for open source based startups um if if i could say a word or two to that also i think i think um there are two kind of immediate ways I think universities can do a bit more with open source. Um, the first is that um, that student projects and thesis work should be should be posted on on GitHub or GitLab or some open source software repository. So my, my university does this already, at least my department. Um, of course, that doesn't mean you're contributing to an open source project, but it at least gets people uh, one step closer to doing that. Um, the other idea would be to tie funding to uh, so funding uh, research funding is often tied to uh, or or makes it conditional that you have to publish your papers open access or you have to share your data uh, if it's possible and I think that uh, adding uh, requirements to share your code could be a, an important nudge or push in the right direction uh, and that's something that at the national level. Uh, the research uh, research funding agencies could could enact uh, quite quickly. I think not everyone would be too happy about it. It's hard to take your code um, and put it uh, put it under the watchful eyes of the crowd. But I think we'd all be better off for it, and I think it would have a virtuous effect and, and lead to a bit more open source. Um, so that that's maybe the second way I'd think about it. Yeah, I think that's in the in the, in the tradition of open science and open access, which which has been put forward by by Moedas, um, previous commissioner. And um, but it's uh, yeah, it's sometimes a little bit hard to kind of go go this way. But I think in the long run, this is this is the way to go. Yeah. Um, I think possibly we've answered then all questions. I see a, a very interesting discussion on. Uh, Hard open hardware and uh, OSPOs, which is something that I think we haven't uh, sort of discussed yet. Of course, OSPOs are uh, a concept that's gaining, gaining a lot of traction, uh, and open hardware at the same time also something that's gaining a lot of traction, um, but it hasn't been kind of or isn't in a very um, structured, isn't happening in such a structured way. So I think it's an interesting point from Julieta here. Um, I think Dietmar is not with us anymore. I just checked the list. So I do think. Then that we maybe patents first. Yes, <laughs> this is a good one. I think this may be a discussion for later. Something that uh, yeah. nobody. I mean, uh, find me the person who has solved the question. How do you how do you measure this? Uh, the, the, you know, the issue of measuring innovation through patents and then open source because there does seem. I remember Knut, you looked at it. There's a relationship there. Uh, patents and open source still, um, um, but it's difficult to to uh, to uh, attack this from an economic econometric point of view as far as I understand. I'm not an economist, so I'm going to... Uh, there, there will be new work. We have just finished a master thesis on this, um, on the on the individual level, very interesting insights, but uh, uh, will take some time. Maybe next, uh, next year's uh, symposium, I will present a paper on this. That would be great. All right, I think we are um, then probably um, out of time with this session. So I would say that we uh, move on again. Thanks a lot to Johannes and Knut. I think that was really, really interesting. Mm -hmm.